Hey guys. Oh, Hello. hey. How's it going? Thank you, how are you? Hi. Hey, Burke. Um, yeah, we're running the thing that we're clicking on something wrong here, it seems to me. Okay, but now you're good. This is, uh, this is where you're supposed to be. Do we have it? Is it choppy? No, it's good. Good. You good? Yeah. Can you hear us fine? Uh, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Lots of people in there. That's why they call it work. Can they all hear us? Hello. <laughs> this is Johanna. You're seeing right here. Hi. How's it going? Hey, how are you? I'm Dan. This is Ali. Hi. Where are you from, Dan? Um, born in Croatia, grew up in Canada. Yeah. And where do you live now? In Berlin? In Berlin, yeah. Cool. I'm I'm a Winnipegger at heart. Yeah, we have a we have a, one of your people here. There's all this and everything. So we just got your questions, so we have no idea what they are. Really. Yeah, okay. it's okay. We can. They're not too heavy. You can roll with it. Hi. <laughs> We normally ask the same uh, questions to every collector that we interview, but this time it's a little bit different because you're an actual office. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Would you describe yourselves as an office or, or as a collective? Just curious. Um, yeah, we're not a, as collective as collectives are, but we are not as office as typical offices are, so I don't know. Yeah. Okay, so we've, we've tried to account for that a little bit more than usual, uh, not asking the same questions like, um, how do you make money? It's <laughs> 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 one that we like to ask. <laughs> okay, do you want to okay. start? Yeah, let's start. Uh, it's really typical for an office um, that we charge for work, and we try to be diligent about charging for the work so that we can pay our people. Yeah. Yeah. And I especially specialize in money make money losing projects as well, where we try to do public service campaigns and things like that that um, that tend to sort of use the resources uh, more so than than I think a typical office would do. So. Yeah. All right, we'll get into some of that kind of stuff. But uh, first, I just want to introduce the conference call. So we started this, uh, our collective on-off started this in um, the fall of 2014, and this is the 13th call. And today we're talking to 5468796 architects, architecture, uh, also referred to maybe as the numbered company, I believe. Yep. Yeah. And maybe uh, I'm Dan, this is Ali, maybe you guys can introduce yourselves over in Winnipeg. Hi, I'm Johanna. Colin, and I'm Sasha, and that's most of the rest of us. Okay, great. Um, okay, so our first question is, what is your company? How would you uh, talk? maybe talk about your origins and uh, how many you are and... Uh, Where did you come from? And the name. We're all yeah. curious. It looks like a phone number to me, but I don't know. Um, it's our... Um, Company Incorporation name, and uh, when we first started, we were walking back from having sort of filed for the corporate papers, and uh, and then decided that, uh, or we've been trying to think what to call the studio, and uh, <clears throat> we had pretty sort of hard to pronounce, difficult last names, and thought, well, that's certainly not it. But mostly, really, it's supposed to reflect the idea that people are working uh, here, working are working with us, and not sort of for some some predetermined entity, so the fact that it's uh, it's this, um, you know, weird number helps in that, in, the, in that messaging. And then, of course, that's the only time and place when you could have gotten that number in Manitoba, so it's sort of a record of that day, too. And you started in 2007. That's right. Um, what, what was the, how did you kind of, uh, start working. It was like Sasha and you that started the company. We, uh, yeah, we started like we. Colin and Johanna and I both went to school together, and oh. Colin. Oh, sorry, oh yeah, and and and. Um, yeah, so Colin we had got difficulty with English. We tried to with speak. English. Uh, Colin, <laughs> uh, 
Colin got kids and got married early, so he started, skipped a couple of years and so on. So we, we sort of lost touch. And Johanna and I kept on working as, together as students, then uh, got a job together in the city for working for the same company, worked there for quite a few years. And then we're kind of disgruntled by um, some of the apathy that we were seeing towards architecture in the city and then said, hey, why don't we give it a shot and, uh, and see if we can change that. And the, uh, or at least change it for ourselves. And so the, uh, that's how we started in 2007. It's purely, uh, it was really a, a reactionary move. We were, we were feeling we wanted to do things that we were, our, the practice we worked for was great, but we wanted to do things that we, uh, we felt strongly about and um, we weren't quite feeling that, that I was being satisfied to, mm -hmm. to practice there. And then we, honestly, we started in my condo and thought we are going to, um, likely fail within the first year and thought we'll be still fairly employable. We were in our early to mid-30s at the time, so it's a time when you I should be employable. I was much younger than that. Than me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and still am. You're still, still younger. Than that. You're still younger. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, You're still almost as much younger. But then Colin was the only uh, one of our peers who then ended up standing as a big sort of card that he had made himself and some sort of cool skyline. I, I yeah. still have it somewhere. And a bottle of champagne to say, like, way to go, guys. This is awesome, whatever. And then... I was part of the apathy before that. I was working for a different firm and sort of wondering what is going to happen in Winnipeg. And it was refreshing to see. So then, take a <clears throat> and then we called him right back and left this ridiculous message in his, uh, in his um, voicemail. So I'm like, hey, come and work with us. <laughs> I don't know. I think we had a few drinks. Anyway, serendipitously, we happened to be in the Vancouver airport at the same time. He was on his way to Seattle, and I don't know what we were doing there. And we had this uh, sort of meeting in the airport lounge where we hatched out sort of a deal, deal about him uh, joining us. So that was, that was cool. About seven months later, I guess? Yeah. So that was your job application, a big card. <laughs> the job application, it was just, we had no idea what we were, we, sorry, we knew less about what we were doing than we do now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and did you have, at this point, uh, when you all met in the Vancouver airport, did you have some projects like renovations or something? Like I, I scrolled all the way to the right on your website and there was this, some uh, apartment renovations or something that were first? Those were, the, those were condos, one is Johanna's and one is mine, that we did while we were with the... Um, working for our employer, our, or the firm called My Architects here in the city, uh, they became a bit of a calling card. Uh, what happened with us, we were convinced we were going to be working in the kitchen renos and basement renos for years uh, after we start. Um, what happened, though, uh, unbeknownst to, so without understanding why, we got a job every day for, I think, two months. No, the first 30 days. First thirty days, yeah. so we had thirty jobs by the uh, by the end of the first month, being in business. Right. Some of them were really small. Some of them were, were large enough for us to to um to sort of sustain the office. And so the uh, we had to we hired the first person was Ken, who's like right there waving. He started with us two weeks in, and then we hired another guy three weeks in. So it it, it really um. What happened is what not, something we did not expect at all. Nor can we still explain, I guess, yeah. today. Yeah. Okay. It was yeah, an opportune time. I came within the first year, and there was already eight or nine people joined, right? Right. Like, I think yeah. I was the eighth or something. Yeah, you came in as an eighth person. So the, we How grew, people we, are you now? There? You're 15 or 16? 15. 15, yeah. Even at the moment, Brandon is 16. Yeah. But it's uh, okay. Maybe we just go with the with the line of questioning. <laughs> so uh, the next question. I mean, we were looking at some images of um, Venice uh, Biennale 2012, which you can maybe talk about. But our question is the Canadian context or your references when you started. What was your uh, connecting point? Like you, you're talking about, you were uh, disenchanted and with some places you were working at, I guess. And uh, what was what were you looking to when you like, what kind of projects did you want to make or how did you get started with the uh, references? I comment on the Canadian context. I, I guess a little bit relating to the the, um, the Venice Biennale project, and that would be just that um, I think 
at least Sasha and I grew up in, in Europe, so we're both from contexts where architecture was much more ingrained into the identity of, uh, of countries. And, um, and then when we sort of landed in Canada in our adult age already, uh, it became sort of clear that uh, it isn't really something that you can, let's say, Google and get a clear answer what is Canadian architecture. Mm -hmm. And so the Venice project was trying to get to the bottom of is there something more potent, uh, kind of underlying, because we're very much an immig immigrant country. Uh, there's all kinds of people with different pockets of kind of strength and, and, and strengthen their identity, and, and whether we could uncover that and find a different way to express what it means to be Canadian. So that was that project, but I think if we talk about our work and its relationship to, you know, the Canadian context, I think it's much more maybe a Winnipeg context that we were originally reacting to. We were sort of trying to react to that, that there was not much going on. How do we sort of try to shake the establishment a little bit? How do we work with the, the parameters that are here, which is very, sort of very uh, um, hard-nosed economy, uh, not a lot to uh, play around with, not a lot of resources to uh, to squeeze architecture into um, into our work and and we knew or learned very early on then from the developer community that we worked for that in order for us to um, instill architecture in any of the work we first have to meet their performance um, and sort of profit quotas and as you know if we do that then there's room to to um, talk about architecture if you beat that if you leave that, uh, that's right. Yeah. If you leave a little bit, uh, it's aside. not an environment that architecture is sort of reduced to luxury, which is probably not uncommon in small markets. Mm -hmm. but Second cities. That sort of reduces it or, or eliminates it from most discussions, and we were trying really hard to. That's the context that this was. So trying very hard to find a way to bring architecture not just as a luxury, but mm -hmm. as as something intrinsic. And rudimentary, rudimentary, so that you can't sort of value engineer the architecture out of it through the course of the uh, the job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in my I think it's uh, so, difficult to have like a political practice, in my opinion, from a European perspective. Would you say that in this uh, developer world? Do you mind repeating that, Dan? Uh, I, I mean, I feel like in the North American context with developers and uh, like the engineers and the construction people taking the legal aspects, it, they make it more difficult to have a political agenda, potentially. Uh, to, to a point, you know what, the, uh, the people are generally good and they want to do the best that they can within certain, uh, within the parameters of, uh, of any projects. So I would say even within, you know, all of our projects, 95% of the time, everybody wants to do their best. Sometimes things get in the way, right? And sometimes those things are political, and sometimes they're um, they're social or economical, and so on. So the uh, trying not to lose sight of that as you move through the process, and as things get tougher, and as you you know the, your ground for two or three years throughout the process process of the project, that is the uh, I think that's one of the strengths that we uh, we bring, uh, which is like we rarely lose sight of the of, of our of our own. Um, I guess the targets are the targets that we've developed with people that we work with. I think he's asking about the difference between the sort of European mm. mentality and, and what we encounter. Yeah, it's hard to speak to North America generally because we are, most of our work, we're not doing work outside the city, most of our work is in, in, in Winnipeg and most of our work is for, uh, for, for uh, I guess, entrepreneurial um, enterprises, so people that need to make money off of it. And so the uh, well. What do you mean we don't work outside the city? We work in. No, we do. But most cities. of our work that's built <laughs> right. you know, has been built here, oh. right? Sorry, we. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. the starting point is not political. The starting point is typically entrepreneurial or, or through developer, etc. So, but what I think one of the things Sasha is saying is that the. That's sort of the starting point. In often cases, it's the ending point with other with other projects, with other practices, etc. But most people have an ambition to engage the political, the social, the those scenes if shown away. And I think that's something that we really feel strongly with. Well, maybe in European practice, which I've never, you know, none of us practice there, you can start with an agenda or start with a social or political agenda. Here you have to start with that. 
entrepreneurial, but you can add it. Um, you just have to be diligent on adding it. Um, but for example, this uh, this uh, project with the table on Esplanada Riel or or these dinners. I don't know how. I don't know. How, I don't know this. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Those are based, those are started kind of on the grounds without uh, money making. Well, if you want to talk about the these projects, the uh, the I think one of the they are actually quite political, if you wish, and I, it, it, and it, it all started really with the uh, with the uh, Venice Biennale. Right? Yeah, yeah, this would be <clears throat> this would be sort of more what we talked about, kind of the public service projects where we're trying to affect. The cultural climate that uh, we occupy, and trying to instill architecture as part of culture, uh, which in Winnipeg at least has sort of very much disappeared um, when we first entered the the field. Anyway, had disappeared from that cultural radar, and so we've been trying to work uh, ever since, I guess, kind of off and on on projects that would would elevate the profile of architecture in the in the larger community. And um, in 2013, then we um, we were lucky enough to receive the Prix de Rome for um, for Canada, mm -hmm. and that allowed us um, <clears throat> some uh, funds to uh, just research architectural cultures around the world. That's what that map is yeah. uh, getting at, and those dinners. Then, so what we propose to do is is have um, <clears throat> eight uh, dinners across the world, really, and uh, and try to get to the bottom through the lubrication, I guess, of wine and 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 food, to what really is at the core, what drives. Uh, um, architectural culture, how it affects your work environment, that that climate that you operate in, and who are the players? You know, whether it's the political authorities, whether it's uh, media, whether it's uh, uh, the developer community. So, what are the forces at play? And and the idea was to bring those lessons back to Winnipeg so that we could implement some of them here. And the finale was the the, the table for 1200 then uh, in Winnipeg. Um, and again. Table discussion about the value of design and architecture, Marcy. But it became, it became um, a really a hottest ticket for for a few days. It did sell in 36 hours. Uh, we had our future mayor at the table and all the mayoral candidates at the time. So the idea was to engage broader public into discussions of design. Um, where there's a lot of discussions, if you wish, internally, um, internally to the profession, uh, and then there's there's a lot of movement. Um, we did it, uh, even on a political level. But the, uh, to engage the general public, that was the uh, that was so that was, tougher, right? that was, that, that was creating an interface. Right? So yeah. they, they've ran another another event like that. The uh, there's a, there's probably uh, ten different things that have happened in the last seven or eight years uh, that have to do with um, advocacy for architecture. We have an architecture foundation. We have an architecture gallery. We have a st storefront for architecture, which is a not-for-profit organization that uh, puts together all kinds of events. Uh, we do warming huts uh, in winter, cooling gardens in summer, um, crit sessions uh, with architects, um, where, where different architects uh, cr criticize each other's work. Uh, we do that both in public and um, so yeah, the front lines working with the, with the local newspaper, right? And the so local newspaper writes about article. We have a fellow that architect that writes for the uh, for free press every three weeks. So there's an art architecture article in the uh, in the local paper coming You're out. You're making it sound weeks. like we did all this. We didn't. No, no, no I'm just saying that this is what's happening. The happening. Yeah. Yeah, so there's definitely something in the water. People wanting to do that. We've been involved in a lot of it, but we're not uh, we're not driving all of it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, and in this same scope of. Uh, we have this question of what is the role of the public in your project? I think you answered Which that you question a lot already, but there's yeah. the obvious uh, the, the hot question, topic. the center village. Uh, yeah, the other part, uh, there's the other part that doesn't relate to these types of projects, but relates to then our um, desire and, and belief that we should be allowing each project to be part of the network of public spaces that create a city. And in this project, as, as well as many other housing projects that we have done, we have uh, tried to carve out public outdoor space, shared community space for, for people to, to occupy. Because we do think that that's perhaps the difference between, uh, again, our background, the, the European uh, sort of setting versus the North American setting, where nobody uh, thinks a multifamily housing complex is something where you can live for life. 
that this would be something that's appropriate for a student or a senior, but it isn't, it isn't a place where you would, um, you know, bring up your family and so on. So we think that it has a lot to do with the lack of that outdoor space, that common space, where you can, as a child, actually forge friendships or, um, you know, have social interactions where you kind of create a community in a way. So we're not saying that architecture does all that, but it certainly can provide a framework where that can occur. Oh. And obviously, there are, there are different views on that, as you have read in, in Guardian and to our responses and our daily analysis. And now Guardian is going to publish our responses of yesterday. So, uh, so we leave we can leave that at, at that. But if one was to look at our work over the last eight or nine years, um, there's been at least ten projects of this type that we've completed, uh, and each one of them was um, trying to 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 tackle the. Um, the issue of low-rise housing and uh, and that typology actually in a different way, um, and I think they're mostly uh, showcased on our website, but the, not all of them are. And each one of them tests tests a different thing. So we are now uh, after they've reached the maturity of four to five years, we are now going back trying to um, trying to evaluate them from user perspective because the that will then feed back to the uh, to the project that we're doing. And I, I think the um, it's a pursuit that we're we're very interested in. Uh, we're doing projects like this now in Toronto as well, and the, um, trying to trying to find the right the right thing to do in those projects is um, sort of a lost art, and uh, we we really uh, we're really interested in finding what the right. Thing is. Mm -hmm. And they start exactly like the, your question was what role is public play in uh, architecture, but. Really, each one of those projects starts from that question: Is what role can the public play in those projects? Um, because the givens are the project, right? That you have to have a certain number of units and a certain you have to do those things. But how do we engage the city? How do we engage? That is really the question that that each one of them tries to tries to answer, and it answers it based on context, based on all sorts of uh, aspects. But the, it, it's an integral to each project. Yeah. I'm just saying we try to make sure that each project makes itself into the city, if that makes sense, and vice versa. We want to make sure that the city can lead itself through the project. And that, that we do through through a sequence, usually, or a necklace, if you wish, of public spaces that we carve out of both physically and from uh, developers, pro formas, uh, and then try to, try to create some sort of a land fertile for engagement, whatever that engagement is. Right. Do you think that maybe you then have too much faith in the public or the city as a as a whole? Um, I would say that uh, like I, I keep telling the story where um, like where I grew up, we would say in the language even that we would say we were we're from that yard or we're from that outdoor space as opposed to from a particular building. Mm -hmm. That's how <clears throat> that's how it worked, and so. It, it does play a huge role in how what again like the kind of community that you associate yourself with, and it's possible, of course, that uh, uh, we place a high sort of expectation on that within our internal thinking. But I don't see how else we could go about it, honestly. Like if if we were to do blocks of buildings where there is no space to occupy, then I don't know. I just I personally probably I actually do believe do that. believe in. in, in power of public. The, uh, if you, as Colin said in, in his conversations with our daily, if you close the door today, it's never going to open, mm -hmm. right? If you keep it open, then uh, there's a potential for a lot of things to happen. And, and you know, cities <coughs> on a very um, academic level are sort of playgrounds for potentials, right? And you have to play to that as opposed to trying to shut the potential down. And I think that's part of the uh, of the of our thinking when it comes to when it comes to creating vibrancy. If you think about Winnipeg's downtown, it was far from vibrant even ten years ago, and and that has been changing um, leaps and bounds over the last years. And it's actually by people recognizing potentials and 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 plugging into it. and so maximizing and like maximizing actually, them. Yeah. actually trying to realize those potentials, not just uh, passing on them. Between, uh, but if you don't create them, then they Exist. Yeah. And exist, right? so, so the projects have to contribute to the, to the, uh, to the life of the city. Yeah, and I think uh, in this Guardian article or somewhere, somebody mentioned this idea of Jane Jacobs in terms of, in terms of casual surveillance of public space and this kind of uh, concept. 
of keeping it open also and not gating down the public uh, courtyards. Um, I mean, this is like a reference, I guess, a Canadian reference, right, Jane Jacobs? Yeah, it's a Canadian reference. You know, one thing that's interesting is uh, Central Village is one of, of uh, six or seven projects that we've done in the in the inner city. Each one of them um, facing similar problems or similar similar milieu, if you wish, and the, uh, and the uh, each one of them is is doing it because of our design um, ambitions, I guess, doing it in a slightly different way. A lot of a lot of things that we've done at Central Village are the things that we've learned from the projects um, next door, which were successful. So the uh, that is it, it's a very curious phenomenon. So we'll figure out where hmm. what, what are the, the good things about it and what aren't. Yeah. Okay. Um, our next question is: How rigid is your the, your projected outcome? So when you actually start working and you come up with these concepts of uh, I guess shuffling uh, space in these uh, housing projects, or maybe in these more smaller scale projects, when you make a sketch, do you allow for things to develop? I think they're not rigid at all. We sort of briefly uh, looked at this question at, uh, before, and and I mean we often even tell our clients that we have no idea what it's going to turn out until the process guides us, and I, I think that sometimes we get looked at and thought as a, a firm that sort of aims for some type of aesthetic, when the reality is that we have all kinds of constraints that drive what we can do in a project, and that's what generates this aesthetic. It has nothing to do with, you know, our sort of preferences in the, in the beginning or some preconceived notion about it. So we really try to be very open. And then, um, you know, if we take the 62M project, which is this sort of um, disc up in the in the sky that's under construction now, um, you know, it would be a good example where it's it's very easy to tell the story of how that all occurred. Uh, there was no um, there was no frontage on the site, and the developer basically asked us, "Can we make housing work on on this piece of land?" Mm -hmm. And so, fairly early on, um, it was determined that you know we do have to lift it up to get any sort of views beyond. Uh, the highway that's right there, the industrial shed uh, with no windows that's right there. And, and then once you lift it up, then you have to find other allowances that allow you to actually, uh, you know, make up for the, <clears throat> the cost that you spent on lifting it up. And then we discovered that, you know, the most efficient form that you can do the relationship of the public corridor to the actual perimeter uh, that determines how many suites you can put in, um, that, the, you know, the round shape is the most efficient. Um, and so it, it's these sorts of things that drive our design process uh, through and through. And so we never do know uh, what comes out the other end. I would actually venture to say that uh, we measure the success of our uh, inquiry, if you wish, or depth of our inquiry for every project by how far it is from what the preconceived notion of the project is. <laughs> we, we keep on surprising ourselves, and, and, and we still do, and we work with the... Uh, there's a bunch of projects that are coming up where, where we certainly say, as the design is finally getting uh, to completion, we certainly say, I would have never, or any one of us, would have never set off to but do this But yet that's project. not the end game. That's not, not like, the end oh, game. let's do something but different. That means, but that means yeah. that we have actually exhausted, yeah. it's, it's exhausted uh, options. Or we, we visited things that we did not know existed. Or, that's a good gauge. And we always land on something. Uh, Inherent to the project, not aesthetic or not something that can be removed, so that because it's all part of the process, and even getting things built is part of the process, and oftentimes things are changing even during that process. As long as you can keep what's inherent to the to the project, like where where um, what is the surprise of it, and, and understand it properly, then it then it doesn't get reduced to an aesthetic or something. That is the ultimate end goal. The end goal was the experience. The end goal was the spatial surprise or the how it inserts itself into the city. But those things that can't be removed, not just the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. The issue is uh, that's very important to us on every project we take is whatever we do will affect not only people that live there, but others that, that are part of the city or the citizens, if you wish. And if you approach every project that way, we find that we carry 
uh, a responsibility, or we feel like we carry, carry responsibility for all 720,000 Winnipeggers with everything that we do. It's like a building block or a brick of, of a facade, right? It has to support the others, and that's that's how we that's how we look at it. So it somehow it has to improve lives of not only people that are directly in touch with it, but the rest or affect their lives. I think the, the old market square stage is, is the um, is the funniest example, which we, where we learned the power of architecture um, when it comes to public opinion, and mm -hmm. we basically split Winnipeg. Uh, I'm not sure if it's down in two halves, but we split it, split it sort of halfway um, between those that like it and those that hate it. And we thought this is a great outcome because yeah. it started a dialogue that uh, that didn't seem to exist before, and all of a sudden architecture was a hot topic. So that was good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, we saw that project uh, when we were in Winnipeg, and I'm I'm a fan. I'm on the <laughs> fan side. <laughs> Me too. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, the next question is about um, we, you kind of uh, started talking about in the beginning there about your construction developer interactions and what kind of roles you play there and how you use your architectural prowess in, in debating with the different actors in developing. Um. I don't think we really can be critical uh, of the developer no. world because uh, obviously we wouldn't exist if they weren't there or they weren't doing what they're doing. They take huge risks um, in the in the whole game of you know getting buildings built, uh, much more perhaps than we do. And um, and builders, uh, you know, the better relationship we have a bit with the builder, the better the project ends up being in the end. So I think we're incredibly appreciative, and um, and that's not to say that there isn't issues and there isn't differences of opinion along the way, but uh, usually our success, if we have any, is, is based on how well we can maneuver through those uh, those differences. It's really a balance between sorry, Colin, balance between the money and the uh, and architecture, if you wish, and the uh, we all want to find the best balance. Sometimes we might have differences of opinion, but we. Um, all people that we work with. Are those things mutually exclusive? Sorry? Are money and architecture <laughs> mutually exclusive? Not at all. Not at all. If you think about it, if somebody comes, in essence, at the outset of every project, a client will come in and say, I'm willing to spend $10 million. Tell me how. Right? Mm -hmm. that, which is, which is what, what it boils down to. Uh, tell me how to do that. And that, that's actually a really, um, I think Colin is the one who identified that as a of, you know, who else gives you that much money to, 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 sort of, to sort of tell them how to spend it? Creatively. <laughs> yeah. But you have to make it intrinsic with it. If it you can't be critical of the developer world, to be honest, everybody, but they have a mandate. Their mandate, they, have, they set themselves up to, to build something to essentially make money off of it. And we have a mandate as well to, to be architects and to design our, our cities and to be ethically responsible, etc. To and and then bureaucrats or, or municipalities have responsibilities to create a framework that creates the proper city. So the developers, it's too easy to be critical of them for what they do and how they, you know, ruin things or don't raise the game. Their mandate was never to raise the game. Mm -hmm. That's why. And so we, uh, we have to we have to do. That. And I maybe I would I would uh, like think about your you question as. Morning? Yeah, I'll have a rat last time. Uh, as, as in cynical, should we be cynical about it? And I think that the moment we become cynical, we might as well stop practicing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess, yeah, like normally the context of the people that we're talking to are people who are opting not to practice in the office environment, but rather to do this. So that's where the question comes from, just to... Yeah, no, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess... So they have chosen to start, like, or never start. And I guess the, <laughs> the other question is maybe not uh, developers, but then the urban planners or the, the guys that impose more strict rules on the structures and, I don't know. Well, I think that too often too, like that's another sort of excuse that gets used for for not creating something. Almost that oh, the rules are too strict, or the developer had demands. I think that our mandate is to work with that, work within those guidelines, and we find that if we were able to do uh, anything, that would be much tougher. Actually, it is the, that those restrictions and limitations that drive the work, and and I think that we feel more successful when we're able to. Um, be proud of a project that we've done uh, within very strict limitations. Mm -hmm. However, we also recognize what 
individual projects can do and, and how far their, their impacts can be. And I think like Johanna specifically uh, drives that policy and, and policy makers, et cetera, in order to impact change because we could, it could be easy. It, it could, we could have frameworks that support architecture and design uh, better and allow for risks and allow for innovation and, and allow for, for smart design and not just try to always eliminate the yeah. lowest common except or, or just establish the lowest common but shoot for the highest and so I think we sort of yes we can do things with projects and, and there's no excuse to not create great work in specific projects but recognize that policy and, and framework is a part of this and, and I think we're very passionate to sort of challenge that as well and to go after that yeah, if there's something that we feel needs to change, then we try to work on how to make from it From both ends, right? Mm -hmm. From the project end, but also from the yeah. top end. Yeah, ur urban regulations or policies are, are unfortunate because in most of the cases they're trying to prevent harm um, towards um, your neighbor, if you wish. Um, and the, uh, I, I think I only desire for one thing, uh, that all, those, uh, all the guidelines, all the rules are... Um, Suffix, if you wish, with uh, with with sort of a clause, unless you can prove otherwise, <laughs> uh, and, the, uh, and the, which would put an onus on architect or the developer or the team to, to to actually do it, right? So if you, if you tell me a regulation is this, unless you could prove that you're satisfying the intent some other way, then that would open all kinds of possibilities uh, for us mm -hmm. to exercise uh, creativity. But without it, you're often stuck going through the processes that take time. Try to effort fit into boxes and yeah. try to fit into boxes that were invented for some other projects, for, or for some other reason, or for some other reason. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of the structure in your uh, office, is like when you have uh, people that you hire and interns, how how do you actually structure your your office? Is it like uh, more like you guys are the bosses and it's a hierarchy, or is it more fluid, or yeah? I think it's it's probably somewhere in, uh, in between. It's not a traditional office in the sense that I think the boundaries are fairly loose. But of course, there is a, you know, when you first we have an actual, you know, like a pay scale that everybody knows. You know, when their first uh, first year intern, this is what they get, and um, you know, when their second year, this is what it should be, sort of thing. So we've been trying to make it very transparent um, in that sense. Um, everybody's paid. Well, we think fairly enough to the industry standard. There's no nobody's working here for free or anything like that. They can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> they can hear you. <laughs> we had this conversation. We had, yeah. we had this conversation before. <laughs> we heard all the words <laughs> other offices, perhaps, and the role of interns. That's we just heard case. this morning that somebody charges for uh, mm -hmm. the privilege of working. And yeah, that happens quite it's often. Then. Crazy some places, yeah. Like New York. So part of our job as, a, you know, if you think about a political um, aspect of it, part of our job is to, um, to, to uh, not undercut our fees, if you wish, so we cannot pay the people yeah. that have actually done the work that somebody else is going to make money off. Like money is not a dirty word in our office. We talk about it often and we talk about it frequently. We have quarterly reviews. We actually, uh, the staff knows what the office makes and how the jobs are performing uh, for the reason that, you know, we can then work collectively uh, to try to improve our situation and so that we would then create a work fair and uh, sort of improve our, our, our level of compensation for all of us together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, just that picture of you guys all working around a table, the way the office is laid out, it, it seems like a very promoting, uh, yeah, you guys aren't sitting in another, I mean, I don't know if you guys are sitting in another desk and coming in and whatever, or just... No, although it's a bit, it's getting short, we're just negotiating for a bigger the space so we can continue. Yeah. Yeah. But it is, every, it's, everybody at the same desk. The, like, we, valuing architecture starts every, like, it isn't just, uh, you know, out there in the world, and it isn't stuff, like, it happens, we have to value our own time, we have to value people's time, like, interns to whoever, if, if, there, if we believe that there's value in architecture, then we should get compensated and paid for contributing to that value. 
They have master's degrees. Like yes, right? just they like we feel that, that that the right. work that we do for our clients should be compensated. Right? It is. It has value. It is not. We're not. It's not out of the goodness of their heart that they've hired. Right? It's there's a value to it, and it can be reflected from the all through the project through the office and so forth. It puts us. We understand that into a weird position where we're competing uh, with people that actually do hire or engage in free, uh, in free labor. Like, as you understand, as people, everybody that you see here, plus, have put at least seven years of their money and time uh, into education to, to achieve a master's degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're not going to pay them. <laughs> but they can't live in North America if you don't pay them either. Mm -hmm. Makes no sense. It's a big problem in Berlin, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> yeah, a lot of precarious labor and um, going out on a whim to, without knowing if you're going to get paid and all this kind of. But, yeah. Yeah, we do it to ourselves. Yeah, we do it to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It, it, it's the wrong message. Like one of the important aspects is that we, um, as Johanna was saying, we have uh, she calls it the non-for-profit initiatives that are very political in their in their agenda. Uh, that are again supported by actually doing architecture, building buildings. That is all supported by I think creating a sustainable office. That we are not able to um, push, if you wish, on all on all aspects of practice of architecture and and, and practicing it uh, on a as high a level as we can humanly achieve, then uh, I think we lose validity in any one of those attempts. So that's why we're trying to be, I'm not sure if we're strong, but we're trying to, to, to put our best foot forward in each one of those, in each one of those aspects of what we do. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, and our last question is your it's proudest. A two part it's question. a two-part question, so maybe I don't know how to split it up amongst the three of you, but you can pick a highest and lowest point in your what uh, eight, Career thus eight far. years, nine years. I don't know how long it is. I think that we sort of uh, it's not really a moment. But I think the one thing that we're quite proud of is the fact that we are from this fairly obscure place and somehow have been able to make it work here or make architecture something in Winnipeg. I, I think that's sort of generally what we... What that was rephrased that we didn't make architecture something, we made our work. No, no, that's what I mean, really. Yeah. That's what I mean. <laughs> um, but, you know, like it's, we, we used to say this thing, and, and you would know this if you're from Winnipeg, but um, <laughs> that if you should be able to make... Uh, you, you should be able to become some some sort of a player, even if you're in flim -flon. So that's sort of what we're trying to mm -hmm. trying to get at. That isn't your context. You don't have to be in New York. You don't have to be in San Francisco or you know Tokyo to uh, to have a, a role to play in architecture. And the fact that we're still in business, you know, nine years later, I think that's what we're that's what we're proud of. Mm -hmm. Come on, failures. Any disappointments? <laughs> sure, of course. There's there's disappointments all the time. There's there's disappointments every day. I think that, that it keeps it moving. Like I don't know, this is maybe a lame answer, but like there are successes and things to be proud of every day. And there's things, there's sort of struggles and, and things that we, okay, we, so that didn't work. So now what? Let's try something else. And I don't think we really dwell on on something that didn't work. We just, okay, we got to find a different answer. We got to find a. You can't sort of just be disappointed in that. In a failure or a failed attempt at convincing someone for that, but the, it's the for me it's the the, the, my, the proudest moments are the the unexpected design that comes to fruition in the built world, and the day that it gets installed or that you get to go to the site and your client you realize for the first time actually understands what they're getting and what and they are thrilled at it. Those are, and those seem to happen on almost every project, and those are those are my proudest moments. I love to turn this, this biggest failure into the proudest into moment. The proudest <laughs> moment. <laughs> good spin. That's good. Spin doctor over there. <laughs> you just have every project, and yeah. then you go to the next day, and, and then you get over it, you and try again. The failures are constant, <laughs> and that's a given. Uh, that we, uh, 
I, they're, they're constant, yeah. They're, they're, they happen daily, and it's, it's how we... But as you can probably tell, we don't dwell on that. We just sort of try to move forward. I think that's one of the things that we're, we're relatively good at. Like, we um, good at in a sense that... What's that? We're in denial? I live in denial. My like, ex-wife yeah. is saying that I, I live in denial. So. <laughs> <laughs> Red with a smile on our faces and go to the next thing. So, so it's not that we're afraid to talk about them. It's just yeah. that, like, yeah, I don't yeah. even know where to begin. Like, <laughs> there's tons. <laughs> All right, that's good. That's good enough. But I also uh, just wanted to congratulate you on the Artist of the Year award that I saw on your webpage, and awesome. all the other awards and your success, actually, because um, we're we. I mean, we live in Europe, and I, I was trying to find a. Canadian group to talk to, and your work uh, kind of came out on obviously on top. And we just want to thank you for talking to us today and well, doing what you're doing. <laughs> and um, yeah, come to and come to Berlin for a visit sometime. <laughs> we will actually we'll be in Germany in uh, this in year, the fall. In the fall, in the fall, yeah. So we'll give you a shout. Cool, cool. great. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much for talking to us. Bye. Bye bye.